The discussion in blog 007 expresses the main concepts of subquantum mechanics for spin. In these next few entries, I will explain the physical insight subquantum mechanics gives. It is important to be able to use mathematics, which is the logic of, say, the left-hand side of the brain, to visualize what is going on using the right-hand side of the brain. The two must be consistent. Heisenberg said that we observe our natural surroundings, and intuitively we develop a visualization of what is going on. We do not need a mathematical description macroscopically unless we need precision, and then classical mechanics works extremely well. However, down at the microscopic world, we must be guided by mathematics that allow us to visualize what is going on. If one accepts that subquantum mechanics is local, which is, of course, contrary to Bell's theorem, then EPR showed that quantum mechanics is incomplete. The only real criticism of their findings concerns their locality assumption, which is questioned solely on the basis of Bell's theorem and one type of experiment. If EPR is correct, then there must be a subquantum theory. Of course, John Bell did a lot more than deduce his theorem. In particular, he clarified the incorrect conclusions by von Neumann that appeared to rule out hidden variable theories. One of the reasons that Bell developed a subquantum theory for spin was to show that indeed a subquantum theory was possible, in contrast to what von Neumann had mistakenly deduced. We have seen Bell's most famous paper before. Let us see what he did regarding subquantum mechanics. He simply assumed that a pure spin is described by a single polarization vector p and a hidden variable lambda. Now all I do is assume that at any instant a spin is not one-dimensional, but it is two-dimensional. Now this makes a lot of difference. Bell, of course, was just using the usual quantum model for a spin one-half as being a point particle with intrinsic angular momentum. In contrast, a 2D spin is assumed to have two axes of spin quantization. It has structure and is not a point particle. This simple extension of spin, which cannot be described by quantum mechanics, resolves the difficulties with quantum mechanics. It removes non-locality and makes new predictions. In addition, the singlet correlations formed from two spins can be written as a product without entanglement is a local model and gives the basis for the anomalies found in EPR data as I discussed in blog 007. As many earlier physicists like Lorentz and Einstein wanted, the 2D spin also restores determinism and causality to the microscopic treatment of spin. But is it correct? Since it agrees with experiment, whereas quantum mechanics does not, then it seems worth pursuing. So to start from the very basic assumption, a spin in the two-dimensional theory, frozen in time at some instant, is assumed to look like this. It is a real object. The magnetic moment of the electron, for example, is known to great accuracy, and obtaining this value theoretically is a great success of quantum electrodynamics. Since the magnetic moment describes the magnetic field, this field is so well defined, it is a real property of spin. Let us think about an electron for illustrative purposes. Please keep in mind that I am thinking of low energies, much less than the electron mass. But spin exists at all energies. Since it now has structure, we need a convenient frame of reference. Call it little x, little y, and little z, called the spin microframe. It is related to the laboratory frame by a simple rotation in three-dimensional space. This model says that a spin has a magnetic moment along the z and the x axes, and it is assumed that the magnetic moments are of the same magnitude as the usual magnetic moment of an electron. At this stage, the small arrow along the y axis is just to define a right-handed coordinate frame. So the total magnetic moment of a two-dimensional spin is given by the vector sum. The unit vector bisects the spin microframe and gives the magnetic moment as 
the square root of 2 greater than the usual spin 1 half lying along that direction. That's about all there is to it. So to summarize, a structured spin cannot be described by quantum mechanics and is oriented somewhere in space which defines a unique microframe, one for each spin. Since the usual spin one half has magnetic moment of magnitude mu, it is assumed that each of the two magnetic axes has the same magnitude and these sum to give a net magnetic moment which is the square root of two greater in magnitude than that of a usual spin. This is directed along the unique axis called n. However, as soon as a two-dimensional spin encounters an electromagnetic probe, one axis of the two-dimensional spin lines up with the field and the other one processes perpendicular to it and averages to zero. It is impossible to tell the difference between the one-dimensional spin and the two-dimensional spin when a field is present. Since we must have a probe to measure spin, clearly the root 2 magnitude spin cannot be directly observed. That is why coincident experiments for photons are so important. They are sensitive to the 2D spin structure. Without these experiments, the 2D spin would be a mathematical curiosity and nothing more.